For the first time in the history of the United States, a postage stamp is carrying the inscription, In God We Trust. Government and religious leaders participated in the biggest ceremony of its kind in the history of the post office department to introduce the eight cent stamp. Postmaster General Summerfield and the officials of the United States Post Office are to be congratulated for inaugurating this postal ambassador that will go abroad to the rate of about 200 million a year. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles has been in London this past week, conferring with British officials on the problems of the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Many observers here in Britain feel that the United States is going to intervene in the war in Indochina. Here in London, it is generally agreed that something must be done about Indochina, but they're not certain just what. There's a great fear that we might become involved in a third world war. British leaders are jittery. You almost have to live in Britain to understand the feeling of the British people. They've come through a terrible war, and they now read in their daily papers that one blast of a hydrogen bomb would make life uninhabitable on this island. They are afraid that a spark in Indochina could eventually bring about the annihilation of Great Britain. However, there are many here that feel that the time has come to stop communism. If ever we are to call their bluff, it is now. If we lose Indochina, so these other people say, then all of Southeast Asia is lost and eventually India. This is a momentous decision that is being made in the capitals of the Western world. The decision that is made in Indochina could affect the destiny of the world for years to come. However, here in London today, the wars and problems of the world are forgotten. It is a glorious Easter day. The streets are crowded with people in their new Easter clothes. Spring is in the air. The trees are budding. The flowers are blooming. People are strolling down Park Lane, Piccadilly, and Leicester Square, very much like they're strolling down Fifth Avenue in New York. Peachtree Street in Atlanta, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, or Wiltshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. Here in Britain, on this glorious Easter Sunday, churches are filled with worshiping, adoring throngs because there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. More people went to church this morning than probably any Sunday since before the war. Christianity, with its living Christ, is unique among all the religions of the world. It has been called the religion of the empty tomb. And because that tomb is empty, hearts are full, churches are overflowing, homes are made happy, and millions of lives are changed through a personal vital faith in him. And in this era of the hydrogen bomb, when one blast could possibly blow the whole planet into oblivion, there is hope in an empty tomb, hope in a risen Christ at this dreadful and dark hour of the history of the world. Let us go back to that first resurrection morning. The darkness of gloom had settled down upon that little band of believers which had followed Jesus through the days of triumph and popular acclaim. But then came the troublesome days of difficulty when the religious leaders chose to trump up false charges against Jesus. They tried him falsely for blasphemy and sentenced him to crucifixion. His death seemed to be the tragic climax of a swift-moving, miraculous but misspent ministry. To these early disciples who had not been able to grasp the significance of Jesus' utterances about his eventual death on the cross, it was all over. They hid in utter despair in the corner of dark, secluded rooms, cowed, whipped, and humiliated. Their hopes of being part and parcel of a new righteous kingdom were destroyed in the rubble of despair. But then came Easter, and the glory of the resurrection, the dawn which inevitably follows night's darkest hours, at long last arrived, bringing with it the ecstasies of a new day. Lift up your heads in soaring ones, and be ye glad of heart for Calvary Day and Easter Day, Earth's saddest day and gladdest day. We're just one day apart. The resurrection of Christ changed the midnight of bereavement into a sunrise of reunion. Mary, broken with bereavement at the death of her master, lamented, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Bereavement and deprivation are both part of a world wrecked by sin and its consequences. The problem of the world at this hour is not the hydrogen bomb. The great problem that mankind is faced with is depraved human nature. Man is infected with a moral and spiritual disease. That disease is called sin. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sinneth shall die. This death that the Bible speaks of is not only physical death, but spiritual death. 
The Bible teaches that you are not only a physical body with eyes, ears, nose, hands, feet, and other characteristics of the human frame, but you're also spirit or a soul. Your soul is your personality, your mind, the part of you that thinks, dreams, remembers, the real you. The Bible teaches that someday your body will go to the grave, but your soul is going to live on forever, either in heaven or hell. The death of Christ on the cross that first Good Friday paid the penalty for sin. And on the third day, God raised Christ from the dead for our justification. The resurrection not only saves man from spiritual death, but takes the sting out of physical death for the believer. It robs the grave of its victory. Death is the enemy of mankind. It is something mysterious to be feared. However, Christ takes the fear out of death. Listen to Paul as he lifts the trumpet of resurrection glory and soars to the heights of immortal ecstasy. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall it put on incorruption, and this mortal shall it put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? A little girl was running toward the cemetery as the night shades had begun to gather. Someone asked her if she was not afraid to go through the graveyard at night. Oh, no, she said. I'm not afraid. My home is just on the other side. We Christians are not afraid of the night of death because our heavenly home is just on the other side. Mary's bereavement was transformed into glorious reunion when she met her resurrected Lord in the garden. Her sad lament, they have taken away my Lord, was changed into an anthem of victory when she exclaimed, He is risen! Secondly, the midnight of disappointment was changed into a sunrise of joy. Matthew, in telling the thrilling story, said, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. The world today is filled with sadness. I stood on a London street corner the other day and watched the people as they passed by. Many had wrinkled brows, sad and lonely faces. If you could interview the hundreds who come to us and pour out their story of broken dreams and shattered hopes, you would be convinced that very few lives today have peace of heart and mind. That is the reason why on this Easter day I would point you to Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ can put a spring in your step a joy in your soul, a thrill in your heart, and a smile on your face. All the disappointment which the disciples experienced came to them because they'd failed to accept the fact of the resurrection. Receive the resurrected Christ, the risen, living Christ today. He can change your life and make you the happiest person in all the world. You that are suffering sickness, disappointment, and bereavement, look for your risen Lord in your garden of disappointment. His, for disappointment is often his appointment for you. All of your vain hopes and aspirations can be revived when you accept the fact of the resurrection and come into personal contact with the risen Lord. Thirdly, the midnight of fear was changed to a sunrise of peace. John said, then the same day at evening, when the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. President Eisenhower pointed out to the American people a few nights ago on television that fear could become one of the worst dangers in America. A close study of history will show that fear spawns most of the world's ills. It is the basis of which many wars between nations are fought, and it is the cause of countless broken homes and broken hearts. It is unquestionably one of Satan's most effective tools. Fear paralyzes and renders its victims incapable of moral action. Many of the nations of the world today are held in fear of communism. They are paralyzed into inaction. They are not willing to stand up and be counted on moral questions. They are ready to compromise at every point. They are ready to say peace at any price, regardless of conscience, honor, or moral integrity. Even the church today is held in the grip of fear, and its effectiveness is hopelessly hampered. We fear the opinion of friends and loss of popularity, the ridicule of the crowd. In fact, we fear everything in the world but God. Ladies and gentlemen, the risen Christ today can take the fear from your heart. I beg of you that know Jesus Christ as Savior to stand up and be counted for Christ. On this Easter day, 
Let's let the message ring loud and clear that the hope of the world at this tragic hour is a risen Christ. You that know not Christ, you have every reason to fear God. You have every reason to fear death. You have every reason to fear the future. But today, faith and confidence and commitment in a resurrected Christ can change your fear to hope, can change your fear to joy. And today, the risen Christ can live in your heart by the power of the Spirit of God. He can change your life and make you a new person if you will surrender to him today as Lord and Master and Savior. Let the risen Christ come into your heart today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God in Christ's name, we pray that the risen Christ will come into the hearts of millions across the earth today. For we ask it in his name. Amen.